Uh, in the previous lecture, we learned about uh, logistic regression in uh, two class, two class setting. You know, when we have two classes, we learned how we can basically uh, learn the parameters of posterior based on some assumption that you know posterior follows uh, you know a form of logistic function. So and. Uh, Logistic regression can be uh, extended to multi-class setting. When you have, you have multi-classes, still you can do logistic regression. It's not restricted to two-class problem. But I'm not going to go through the details of multi-class problem. It's part of your second assignment to derive uh, logistic regression for multi-class. It's almost in many books that you can refer to, and some details are on Wikipedia that you can check as well, but you're gonna see the detail uh, through your second assignment. Okay, so, so far we have learned a couple of different classifiers, LDA, QDA, and logistic regression mainly. So how do you compare these uh, classifiers? Basically, how do you compare LDA and logistic regression? Both of them are linear classifiers. So, uh, is there any advantage of using one of them compared to the other one? So I uh, briefly mentioned in the previous lecture one advantage that logistic regression has compared to uh, LDA is the number of parameters that you have to estimate. Number of parameters is always a big issue. Uh, you know, in learning, if uh, that there's a problem, most likely you have heard of, it's called the uh, cares of dimensionality. We have a computational curse of dimensionality. We also have a statistical curse of dimensionality. In high dimensional space, uh, learning is hard. Uh, if you need 10 data points to estimate a parameter in two dimensional space, same parameters if you want to estimate it in three dimensional space, the number of points that you need exponentially grows. You need 100 points then. In 1,000 point next dimension and so on. So in high dimensional space, you need many points for estimation. And it's, it's hard. So if you have a method which doesn't need too many parameters to be estimated, it's an advantage. So in uh, logistic regression, how many parameters do we need to estimate in logistic regression? Suppose that x is d-dimensional. If x is d-dimensional in logistic regression, how many parameters do we need to estimate? Sorry? We need to estimate d plus 1 because beta is going to be b-dimensional and then you have beta null which is scalar so you have d plus 1. Uh, parameters. What about LDA? How many parameters do we need to estimate in LDA? So we need to estimate the mean of each class in LDA, right? So what's the dimensionality of the mean? D. So I need 2D for means of these two classes. I have a prior of each class. And so I have two for priors of each class. I have a covariance matrix, which is D by D. How many parameters do I need to estimate for? Sorry? D plus one times D over two. D plus one times D over two. And why is that? Because there's a symmetric a matrix. Exactly, because covariance matrix is symmetric. You don't need d squared. You need less. So that's the minimum number of parameters that you need to estimate. I can even argue and say you may need more because in LDA we assume that the covariance matrices of two classes are the same. In practice, how are you going to estimate this common covariance matrix? You need to estimate the covariance matrix of class one, 
estimate the covariance matrix of class two and then take average of these two and assume that this is the common one, right? Maybe you need more than that. But the, the key point here is that uh, the number of parameters grows quadratically with the number of dimension. But here the number of parameters grows linearly with the number of dimension. So that's a big advantage for logistic regression that the number of parameters grows linearly, not quadratically, if you compare it with LD. So another thing that we noticed in logistic regression was that we directly, you know, that was Bayes' rule. In uh, LDA, we had to maximize this quantity, which was class conditional times prior. So we had an assumption for prior. We had an assumption for class conditional. In logistic regression, we directly maximize posterior. Somehow here, we uh, basically leave the distribution of data in each class unspecified when we are doing logistic regression. I don't make assumption about the distribution of the data in class. Class conditional is unspecified, which, is, which could be a good thing, you know, because most of the time the assumption that class conditionals are Gaussian is a wrong assumption. We just make this assumption for simplification. This is not a correct assumption about the real world. So it's not bad to have a method to leave it unspecified, you know, don't make assumption about it. Okay. That's another advantage. Uh, <clears throat> any question? Okay. You know, in logistic regression, we uh, modeled each class by a function of this form. Or the complement of this, right? Basically, we applied a logistic function to a linear function. Because the linear function by itself cannot uh, model the posterior. Posterior is a probability, it needs to be between zero and one. But beta transpose x could be any, anything, you know, any values. So we apply a logistic function to this to make it limited between zero and one. So what happens if I don't apply this logistic function to this linear function? Assume that I can model my posterior using beta transpose x, regardless of the fact that it's not limited between zero and one, so it's a wrong assumption, but we used to make wrong assumptions, right? So let's make another wrong assumption and uh, try to model the posterior using beta transpose x. So in, in it, if you try to do this, you know, it's called a linear classifier. Many of these functions are linear class for, but you know, it's specifically, you know, you're fitting a linear line, a, a linear function to your data. So as if you are doing regression. When you are doing regression, what do you do? You know, if you have a set of points and you want to fit a line to these points for regression, you can do list of square, right? You can, you have y, and x, and then basically you can write that, okay, my function is beta transpose x plus beta null, and uh, so I can, as usual, get rid of this beta null and absorb it in beta. So there is a function that I can minimize and uh, for regression, and uh, it has closed form solution, you know, 
I can find beta in closed forms, less the square problem. So we can do exactly the same thing for classification. Assuming that this y is your class labels, negative one and plus one. And then find beta which uh, basically map x to plus one and negative one. Since this is, uh, you don't have any limit on this line, what's going to happen is that points are not discrete. I mean, beta transpose x at the end of the day is not discrete. It's not equal to exactly one or negative one. It could have any real value, right? Positive or negative. But you can apply a sign function to it afterward. Basically, look at the sign of beta transpose x. If the sign is positive, assume that it's a positive label. If it's negative, assume that it's a negative label, okay? Uh, so that's, that's a way to do classification, simple way to do classification. You may think that it's a disaster because we have many wrong assumptions here. In practice, it may lead to a decent classifier in some cases. Even you can show that making some additional assumption, you can make this classifier identical to LDA in some cases. You have it in your assignment. If you uh, basically set the label of each class as n divided by, say for example, you have class one and you have class two, and in class one you have n1 data point, and in class two you have n2 data point. So set the label of class one as positive n over n minus one, and the other class negative n divided by n over n2, number of data points. Say, for example, you have 100 data points, 50 is in this class, 50 is in the other class, so labels of this class would be two, the other one would be negative two. With this assumption, with this additional assumption, you can show that under some condition, this classifier is identical to LDA. So it's not that bad, so it may lead to a, a decent class. Okay, any question? Okay, so we are going to uh, move to a new <coughs> algorithm. Perceptron. Perceptron is quite old method for classification, uh, 19. 58, it was invented by uh, Rosenblatt, but it's building block of a neural network. So uh, the, the history of actually neural network and perceptron has always been up and down, you know, when it was invented, it was very big deal. If you look at the news of that time, uh, there are all sort of news that we have solved artificial intelligence. We are done. You know, there is a there is an interview in 1958 with Rosenblatt, uh, basically reporter based on his understanding of what Rosenblatt said. It claims that soon perceptrons can walk, talk, and even reproduce themselves. So they thought that artificial intelligence is done, 1958. There are many news of this form. And it took about uh, 11 years until 1968 or 69 that this dream about artificial intelligence and the impact of perceptron of artificial intelligence was basically shattered, you know, in was 11 years later that the one book was published by Minsky and uh, he and his co-author showed that perceptron is a linear classifier. So it was not quite clear that, you know, I, I just told you when I started perceptron, I told you it's a linear classifier. It was not clear to researchers that what's the nature of this invention is, you know, until 
11 years later that basically they showed that it's impossible for perceptron to solve XOR problem. It means that if you have a class positive here and negative class is here, so you can't classify this by a linear classifier. You can classify it by a nonlinear classifier. You know, this could be boundary. But by linear classifier, you can't do this. So, and in, in their book, they showed that perceptron cannot solve this problem. And it was a, you know, a surprise, you know, a shock that, oh, we can't do this using perceptron. It was quite uh, unexpected for many researchers. So, uh, the, the dream actually was shattered in 1969, but as I said, it was bin, building block of neural network. Neural network uh, in 80s uh, became a, a really, you know, significant part of research and application because in 80s, you know, there were algorithms to train neural network like backpropagation, which is it's basically, you know, layers of perceptron. You know, neural network is different layers, a couple of layers of perceptron. So uh, in 80s, it became a big deal. Neural network became a big deal until, you know, about uh, 90s or so that, again, you know, people start to lose their interest in neural network. And there was a period of time, about 20 years, that it's called... Uh, they call it in the area of neural network, they call it the neural network winter. Uh, I still remember the time that uh, in NIPS, NIPS, you know, is one of the most uh, dominant uh, venue for machine learning research as a conference. In NIPS, they used to uh, announce most frequent word in the title of rejected papers, unofficially, you know, they used to uh, announce that. And for two years, the most uh, frequent word in the title of rejected papers was neural and network, it was these two words. Until 2006, that uh, a paper by Hinton was published in Science. Basically, neural network was rebranded as deep network later on, so deep network again became, which is just neural network with many layers, became again a very big issue. You can look at the news again now and see many success stories day after day about neural network and about deep network and classification, pattern recognition, natural language processing, and so on. Uh, they have, uh, now they have a state of the art uh, performance in many competitions, in many areas, in pattern recognition, in the speech recognition, they have a state-of-the-art uh, performance. <laughs> so we are going to start from perceptron, and then we are going to learn how we can build neural network based on perceptron, and uh, basically how to train neural network. But we are not going to spend uh, more than a couple of lectures on neural network and perceptron because there are other algorithms that we need to cover as well. Okay, perceptron basically uh, is quite simple. You know, there are a couple of students here who they are taking deep network course with me this semester. So the first lecture of Deep Network, I talked about perceptron and backpropagation. So if they are in this class, uh, I'm sure they're, they're going to get bored because they heard this story once. So I don't get offended. If you want to leave the class, feel free to do so. Uh, OK, perceptron is basically, you know, suppose that you have a d-dimensional data point. So x1, x2, up to xd. So my x, vector x, is d-dimensional vector. So I feed this uh, d-dimensional 
vector to this perceptron, and then I have a weight. Let's, let me call it beta 1, beta 2 to beta d. And there's a linear function here, which is basically summation of all beta i, xi, i equal 1 to n, plus beta null. And the output of this function, here there is a sine function. So exactly like what I told you now about using a linear model and apply like a uh, list of square method and then put a sine function on, on the output and see if it's positive or negative. Exactly the same thing, you know, there's a sine function here. If beta, if the summation is positive, I'm going to label it as positive one and otherwise I'm going to label it as negative one. Okay, that's perceptron. So at the beginning of perceptron, they didn't know how to train perceptron, basically given a data set, they didn't know what the optimum set of weights are. They used to randomly change these weights until, you know, the, solu the, the, the uh, solution, you know, is acceptable or is good. But now we're gonna study basically, uh, you know, one algorithm to train this perceptron, to find the, the optimum solution. Okay, uh, we know that perceptron is a linear uh, function. So, it's a linear function of this form, beta transpose x plus beta null. So let me tell you a little bit about the geometry of this linear function, and then through this geometry we can define an objective function and then minimize that objective function and minimize the error and find the optimum way. For any linear function, you know, in two-dimensional it's a line, in higher dimensional it's a hyperplane. If I choose two points, for any two points on this hyperplane, for basically all x1 and x2 on the, on, on, on the hyperplane, uh, beta transpose x1 plus beta null is equal to beta transpose x2 plus beta null equal to z, you know, because they're on the line. So they satisfy this equation. So it means that beta transpose x1 is equal to beta transpose x2 is equal to Zero means beta transpose x1 minus x2 is equal to z. Beta is a vector. x also is a d-dimensional point. I mean x1 minus x2 is a vector. So x1 minus x2 is a vector. And beta is a vector. Now I tell you that beta transpose times which is a vector, times this vector is equal to zero. I mean, times means dot product. Dot product of these two vectors is zero. So what can you conclude from this fact? Sorry? They are orthogonal. So I can conclude that beta is orthogonal to x1 minus x2. So basically, beta is orthogonal to the hyperplane. Okay, so that's the first fact that I can conclude from the geometry of this line. So second fact, for any uh, point on the hyperplane, I can I can say that beta transpose x null plus beta null is equal to zero. 
right? It means that beta transpose x now is equal to negative beta. <coughs> it's the second. Okay. Now I assume that I have a point which is not on this plane. I have a point uh, here, point X. <coughs> and I would like to find the distance between point X and this plane. Okay? I would like to find this distance. Any suggestion? How can I do this? How can I find this distance? Knowing the facts that we have learned so far, yes? Okay. Sorry, say, say it again. So these are diagonal to x1 and x, the line that x1 and x2 are in. Right. So it points this way, so if you do the dot, I'll put it with b, and b is normalized, then should we get the distance to? Yeah, but I have to project what to d? Oh, uh, it's a point. Yeah. I mean, you are in the right direction, you know. b is orthogonal, and I need this orthogonal, basically, distance. Any distance between x and any other point, if I project it on direction of beta, would be the distance. Right? So basically, I can compute the distance between x and any point that I would like on this line, and then project it to the direction of beta. So any arbitrary point, you know, if I choose like an arbitrary point x null, which is here, and find the distance between x and x null, which is easy to find, then I can project this on the direction of beta, and it gives me the distance, given that beta is normalized. Okay. So to find distance, basically, you know, I can find the distance between x and x null, which is just x minus x null, and then project it to the direction of beta. Project it to the direction of beta means beta transpose x minus x null, right? Okay, so this is D, the distance. I mean, it's not quite precise to say it's distance because distance is always positive. This value, this quantity could be positive, could be negative, depends on, you know, we are on this side or on the other side, you know, because this x minus x null could be positive value, could be negative, could lead to a negative value. Okay, so this is beta transpose x minus beta transpose x null. But what is beta transpose, negative beta transpose x null? It's just beta null, right? So this is beta transpose x plus beta null. So if you want to find the distance between point x, and hyperplane beta transpose x plus beta null, you just need to put that point in this equation, right? If it's on the line, it becomes zero. If it is not on the line, it's either a positive value or a negative value. Okay. Is it clear? Okay, this could be positive or could be negative. I would like to make it positive. I need real distance. 
you know. I don't care if it's on this side or on the other side, just I want to know how far this point is from the hyperplane. So what should I do? What should I do? Sorry? D? So D is positive or negative? I want it to be positive. What should I do? Okay. So basically, you know, it's the absolute value of D is positive always, right? In order of taking absolute value, I can multiply this by yi. Because if the points are in on this side, it's positive. And assume that we are doing classification, all points on this side are plus 1. So plus 1 times the positive value is positive. Points on this side have negative sign. And if this is negative, then minus 1 times the negative value would be positive. So this is real distance, you know. Or real distance. So basically, real distance would be yi times beta transpose xi plus beta naught. So that gives me the positive or the real distance between point x and the hyperplane. Given the setting that I have two classes, one class is positive one, the other class is negative one. Okay. Any question? Okay. Um, now I need to find an objective function and basically find the optimum uh, weight, you know. I need to define an objective function. So we can come up with an objective function, you know. What would be the objective function that you suggest? You know, I have two classes. Some of them are positive. Some of them are negative. Beta transpose x would be a linear function plus beta null. I want to set beta in a way that separate these two classes well. So I need an objective function. What should I minimize or what should I maximize? What's my goal? Sorry? Maximize the between um, maximize the distance between decision boundary and each class. Is that a good idea or a bad idea? You are completely far away from all the Sorry? You can have it just far away from all the points, right? By that. Why? It'll be maximum distance, but you won't be classifying it. Yeah, if it's maximum if it has maximum distance from two classes. Right. So if it's right between two classes. Because you know, there are infinite number of solutions here. If data points are separable, there are infinite number of solutions infinite number of correct solutions. And there are some numbers of solutions that are wrong, you know. They classify points in a wrong way. They put everything on one side or some of the points. Are. So one suggestion is that we choose the one which is right at the middle. Is it good or bad? Yes. Sorry? the minimum of error 
No, actually, it's not the same. This is pretty good idea. It's a very good idea. But this idea was not known at the time of Perceptron, or people didn't know how to do it. This is actually support vector machine that we're going to learn later on in this course. Support vector machine is a classifier which maximizes the distance, has the maximum distance, maximum margin. It's also sub support vector machine is also called maximum margin classifier. So it has maximum margin from both classes. It's a very good idea. But so unfortunately, we didn't know this at that time, and we pretend that we still don't know. So we are at the time of Perceptron, 60s, and we want to solve this problem. So let me make it simple. You know, any solution, I'm happy with any solution that point the points correctly, yes? Maximize the distance of projection of the point on the decision boundary? From the decision boundary? The mean of these points from the decision boundary, right? So, how is this idea? If you have a rough lawyer, the means of the process would be. Mm -hmm. okay. It would be the same, right? If it is parallel, it's just some other distance, like two light, the sum would be the same, isn't it? The sum of? Sum of the distance, the projection. Mm -hmm. For all the points, view, the sum of two groups. If you have a parallel line, it should be the same, isn't it? The same as? Same as. All of the distance would be the same? No, the distance wouldn't be the same because some of them are far from the... Yeah, I mean, if there are two lights that are parallel to each other, just move. But if you sum the distance, mm -hmm. it's like... like this. <coughs> mm -hmm. Okay. You know, it, this is basically pretty similar to the objective function that we just had. When you are minimizing this cost function, in fact, <coughs> it's as if, you know, as if you have some, say, elastic band here, and you leave the point in a way that, you know, it's settled, you know, all plastic band here try to, you know, pull it toward themselves and you leave it somehow that it gets settled, you know, but the distance here is the squared distance. It's pretty similar to this idea that we minimize the, the squared distance here. So we can uh, minimize norm one here actually. That, that's going to be a, uh, basically absolute value of the distance and if the squared distance, you know, in one case, we are minimizing square distance. In the other one, we are minimizing the absolute value of the distance between norm one and norm two. And uh, the outlier problem that you mentioned, I mean, it's going to be more robust in this case compared to this case. Yeah, that's, that's an idea and it's a good idea, but that's again is not what historically has been done in the case of Perceptron. Uh, you can see that it's not only one solution to the problem. You know, you can come up with many different objective functions and all of them could be good. Some of them are going to even be better than the others. You know, most of the problems in machine learning can be simplified this way that the problem is to estimate a function for this, estimating this function, I define an objective function, and this objective function is a way of ranking, you know. This function is from a function class. So we define a function class. In this case, our function class is all of linear half spaces, right? 
the function class of all of these linear functions, that's my function class. I would like to choose one of these. I have a way of ranking all of the members of F. The way that I rank all of the members of F is my objective function. Basically, I would say that the member which minimizes this is the best one or the member which maximizes is the best one. So that's my way of ranking. So we can have different objective functions, you know, just you suggested a couple of different objective functions. Maximize the maximum margin. Minimize the uh, square root of distance. Minimize just the absolute value of distance. These are different way of ranking the best one. And then, I've, then we have a way to search in this class and find the one that we basically uh, the one which satisfies your, your ranking. So most of the machine learning literature is either about richness of this class, the way of different ways of ranking, which is objective function, an elegant way to search in this function class and find one of the one optimization, you know, how I can search efficiently, optimization. Okay, the objective function here, which historically was defined, was misclassification error. So I would like to define, you know, point in a way that the number of points that have been misclassified is minimum. So basically, this is good because it doesn't misclassify any point. This is bad because it does misclassify one point. And there is no uh, preference between these lines because none of them misclassify any point. So I have, I need to define an objective function based on the number of points that have been misclassified. The, imagine, you know, a function, you know, counting the number of points that have been misclassified. It's a discrete function. It's either one or two or three or four. Usually discrete functions are bad objective functions because you cannot take derivative of that and you cannot search efficiently, you know. You have to come up usually with a continuous objective function to be able to take through it. So, mis, I mean, misclassification itself is not a good objective function. Let's try something different. And this something different, which is pretty close to misclassification, objective function, is the distance between points and decision boundary of misclassified points. There are some points that have been misclassified. I would like to minimize the distance of those points to the boundary. Okay? Okay, so I would define, you know, a summation over all points that have been misclassified. So M is the set of points that have been misclassified. So set of points that have been misclassified, their distance to the boundary can be defined this way. Okay, and I want minimize this function, minimize this distance. I don't want them to be far from decision. So this is my objective function. I'm wrong here by a sign, you know, this should be negative. Do you know why? Sorry? The overall value would be positive and minimize the positive value, the minimize the distance. We said that the distance is y i times beta transpose x i plus beta null. Right? Because beta transpose xi plus beta null is on this side, and this side is the side of positive numbers. Or it's on this side, which is negative, and this side is the side of negative numbers. So multiply this by negative value. Now, originally I put yi beta transpose xi, but then I said I'm wrong, but I have to put the negative value. Do you know why? Yes. Because it's misclassified. They have to be. 
on this side when you put the mislabel. So exactly. Exactly, because I'm summing over all points that have been misclassified. Points that have been misclassified means they're on the wrong side. You know, they have the wrong uh, label. So I need to, to have a negative value, negative sign here to make it positive. Okay? So this is my objective function. Now I have to minimize my objective function. So I have a way of ranking. So I have my function class with linear subspaces. Now I'm going to rank them according to this objective function. Now I, I need a way to search among all values, find the one which minimizes this. So okay, one simple way for uh, basically minimizing objective functions is actually we know that we can take derivative and set it to zero you know, if there is a closed form solution. But if there is no closed form solution, one way actually is uh, gradient descent. You know, gradient descent means that you have an objective function. You know, I have this objective function. You know, I can uh, take derivative, set it to zero, and it gives me the minimum if there is closed form solution. But suppose that there is no closed form solution. I can take derivative, but I cannot solve for derivative equal to zero. But derivative at each point give me the direction towards the minimum, right? Suppose that I'm here. When I take derivative, this is, I mean, derivative is always tangent to the function, right? It's tangent to the function at this point, so it gives me direction, so it tells me go this way. So I will go this way. I take derivative. It tells me go this way. I go this way, take derivative. Okay, that's bad, you know, it, it say it goes up. I can't go up, so I go back. So I think that that's the minimum. That's the nature of gradient descent. Gradient descent, and each step tell me what's the direction that I have to go, and I go, you know, until I get to a point that when I take, compute the tangent, tangent is upward, so I, I don't go upward, I stay here. So gradient descent can be used, but gradient descent give me a local mean of the function, not the global minimum, okay? But if the function is convex, it's okay. If the con function is convex, we go and we're gonna find the global mean, okay? So we are going to apply gradient descent in this case. So to apply gradient descent in this case, I need to take derivative of this function with respect to my variable. I take, need to take gradient of this function with respect to beta and then take the gradient of this function with respect to beta naught. So gradient of this function with respect to beta. So I have a summation. I is in M. So I have this term, yi beta transpose xi gradient with respect to beta is <coughs> yi xi, right? And then I have yi beta null gradient with respect to beta is zero. I have another parameters here, beta null. I have summation. So gradient of yi beta transpose xa with respect to beta null is zero. Gradient of yi beta null is yi. So that's my gradient. If I have the gradient, then we are done. You know, we can do gradient descent. <laughs> Gradient descent, as I explained to you, work this way. You know, you start with initial value. So I start with some initial value
And then, basically, or not be confused, let me call it one. Then, um, I'm going to update my beta and my beta null. How I'm going to update beta at time t plus one or r plus one is just beta at time r minus derivative of the cost function with respect to beta. And beta null at time r plus one it's just beta null at time r minus derivative of the function with respect to beta null. Okay. We usually need a coefficient here as well, which is called uh, learning rate. You know, in this example that I showed you, you know, I take derivative, I, I'm here. And I take the derivative, so that's the tangent. I have to go this way. When I have to go this way, I can go one step or I can go 10 steps this way. So how many steps should I take? That's your learning rate here. So how far you are going from your existing point toward the direction of uh, minimum. Okay, it's called uh, learning rate. Should I choose lambda large or small, do you think? Any preference? When I'm here, you know, and I know this is the direction that I have to go, should I go 10 points, 10 steps, or I, I go just one step? First, just start with and then smaller values in order to increase that. Why do I have to do that? Mm -hmm. All right. You know, the, uh, if you choose a smaller steps, it takes forever to converge, you know, because each time, you know, I just go one step to work. But if you choose larger step, then there might be a problem here. You know, I may, I'm here, you know, toward this step, you know, I go really, you know, far from here. Say, for example, I'm here, you know. And this is the step that I have to go in instead of taking here, you know, this step will take me here. Because it's too large a step. And then I take derivative, it tells me that I have to go to this direction, but I take a long step, I get back here. You know, I may start to toggle between these two or jump from here to there. I, I may miss the minimum. So this is tricky to choose. And you're right, usually in gradient descent, we choose learning rate to be large at the beginning and then decrease it later on. So we can define this to be a function of the number of iterations. When you have more, I mean, number of iterations is higher, this value gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay. Okay, so that's basically what we need to do. And uh, so uh, that would be basically, you know, our final algorithm that this as r plus 1 r minus rho this derivative you know this derivative you know I have a negative sign here so I will plus here this derivative would be sigma yi xi and this is going to be yi Okay, in practice, usually people don't put the sigma here. Do you know why? So the gradient at this point is sigma yi xi. Instead of sigma yi xi, basically sigma yi xi, sigma over all points that have been misclassified. Give me the direction that I have go toward that direction. But instead of taking the sigma over all yi xi, I just look at yi xi and go to that direction. 
This is called a stochastic gradient descent. You know what I told you to go toward the direction of um, uh, gradient is gradient descent, but one approximation of gradient descent is a stochastic gradient descent. Another approximation is mini batch gradient descent. And the reason is that in practice, sometimes computing this summation is hard. I mean, computationally hard. You know, it takes time to go over through all of the points. So what we do in practice is that we feed the network. You know, we start with some random beta. Random beta tell you, give you, you know, one line somewhere. Okay. So I feed this network or this perceptron with one point, my first data point, x1. And then I look at the output. Either this point is correct or has been misclassified, you know? We know that. So if it's correct, that's fine. If it's misclassified, you know, I have to, it, it comes to the summation over all misclassified points. I just care about the single point that I fed to perceptron now. I don't care about other points, what this line think about other points. So if this line doesn't work for this single point, I'm going to correct it a little bit. I don't know if it works for other point or not. Then I go to the second data point, do the same thing. The third data point, do the same thing up to the last data point, OK, n. Then I come back from the beginning, first, second, up to the last. And I repeat this process many, many, many times until it converges, until I can't make it better. You know, it converges means that beta doesn't change anymore. Beta doesn't change me anymore means that I'm at the minimum of this cost function, so it's good. So we are here. You know, that's the tangent. Then tangent doesn't change me anymore. So we stop there, okay? So a stochastic gradient descent is quite an important fact, uh, method in uh, neural network now. I mean, all of the real neural networks basically use this a stochastic gradient descent or batch gradient descent instead of gradient descent because this computation is going to be hard. Any question? OK, let me tell you a couple of facts about uh, perceptron. So the first fact, if uh, the data is linearly separable, then perceptron converges to A separating Harpy plane. In a finite number of iterations. We can prove this, you know, that uh, if the data uh, is linearly separable. You know, sometimes data is not linearly separable. This is one class, this is another class. This is linearly separable. But sometimes the data is not linearly separable. So there is no line to make distinction between these two classes. So if data is linearly separable, I mean, being linearly separable means there exists, you know, a gamma such that beta transpose xi plus beta null times yi is greater than equal gamma for uh, all xi, yi. 
So this means that the data is linearly separable. You know, there's a gap between two sets of data. If data is linearly separable, in, you can prove that in a um, finite number of iterations, you can find the solution. You can find one solution, not the solution, you know, a solution. Depends on the initial value, you're going to get one solution. And this solution is the solution which makes distinction between these two class perfectly in the training set. But there are many of them, you know. There are infinitely many of them. And one of them are going to be compute through this process. OK. Uh, so the number of iterations depends on learning rate and the scam, how far these two classes are from each other. If the classes are very close, it takes a long time to converge. If they are, <coughs> excuse me, if they are really far apart, then you're going to find the solution with less number of iterations. If the data is not linearly separable, then it will not converge. If data is not linearly separable, you're going to see that you know, you're going to find a beta you know, it's going to toggle between two situations. You're going to find a beta, then this beta change to another beta, and then come back. You know, you're going to toggle between two situations. So this uh, could be a sign. Could be a sign that rho is not, I mean, your le learning rate is large, or could be a sign that data is not linearly separable. OK, what else? Uh, So it can solve only two class problems. And uh, if data is linearly separable, there's infinitely many solutions to the problem. Okay, uh, so uh, you can guarantee that if the solution exists, you're going to find the solution. But the number of iteration could be very large if gamma is small. So if two classes are closed, uh, then it's going to be quite large. Any any other question? Okay, so we learned perceptron because perceptron is a building block of neural network. So now we want to learn about neural network. So neural network is basically different layers of perceptron. So uh, here we have input, you know, say this is x1 and this is xd. In neural network, I'm going to have a perceptron and I'm going to feed this perceptron with all of these x1 to xd as my input, okay? And this perceptron is going to take summation of this. Basically, it's going to be a beta transpose x or w transpose x. 
then we are going to apply a sine function to it. That was perceptron, right? And then it has an output. In neural network, instead of sine function, sine function, we usually, you know, have a smooth function. So it looks like sine, like a sigmoid function or hyperbolic function. But this is not the only perceptron that I have. I have another perceptron exactly with the same configuration and I feed all of the data points to this one. And I have many of them. Then I have another layer of perceptron. And this another layer of perceptron is going to be fed by the output of the previous layer. But same thing will happen, you know, weighted sum of these inputs and a nonlinear function, a sigmoid function will be applied to those. And you can have many of these layers, okay? And at the end, I can have one node or I can have more than one node. The output of all of these layers will come here. Again, this is a perceptron. And this is going to be my output. This is called output layer. This is called input layer. And these are called hidden layers. OK? So soon after uh, the invention of perceptron, people start to make this a structure, put them together, but they didn't know how to train them. Basically, they didn't know how to find these weights. And they used to randomly change these weights. In some cases, the result was really good. Uh, in 80s, different researchers independently find a way to train this type of a structure. And this algorithm is now called backpropagation. So neural network became a very favorable structure for machine learning at that time because we knew how to find, and we're going to learn this in the next lecture, how to train this using backpropagation. This is one structure of neural network, which is called feedforward neural network. So again, it's a function class. You know, it's a function class that we are going to search in this function class using backpropagation algorithm, which is gradient descent, again. Uh, the complexity of the function of this function class depends on the number of layers and depends on the number of nodes on each layer. One problem that uh, basically, you know, after a while researchers faced, and that was one of the reasons that they then used neural network afterward, was that backpropagation at that time it was a belief that backpropagation works for the case that we have only one or two layers of hidden variable. If you have more than one, backpropagation doesn't work. You know, we can't train your network. And, uh, you know, there's a concept in learning, it's called generalization. We're gonna see this concept more, more uh, in depth later on. So it was clear that you can increase the flexibility of your function by adding node to a layer. But this function is not generalized well. It's not generalized well means that it can learn your training set perfectly. But if you show a new data point to the network, it doesn't generalize. It doesn't find uh, basically uh, the right label correctly. Okay, so we can make it very complex. 
but it's going to overfit your data. You know, it's going to learn your training data perfectly, but it's not going to learn any new data point. Also, there was this experience that if you add layers, then it's going to generalize well. But we didn't know how to train it. We didn't know how to solve the problem. So what happened in 2006 was that Hinton, for the first time, showed that if you have a deep network, you have many layers, how you can train, you know, come up with a new algorithm. Uh, to, to train this deep network. Later on, it became clear that even backpropagation works for deep, deep, deep networks with the right computational power and some assumptions. Okay. So uh, I think I'm not going to start backpropagation. Instead, I'm going to show you a couple of demos of deep network that, you know, some of these success stories and so on that some of them are related to classification, some of them is not related to classification. You know, some of them are not related to classification. In classification case, you know, they have state-of-the-art performance, you know. There, there was this competition on a, a very huge data set, which is called ImageNet, with millions of data points there, and they beat everyone else using this neural network by a big factor. You know, they're ahead of almost everyone. But something quite interesting, you know, uh, you can see in some, in the literature of neural network recently. This was a paper in 2013 that using neural network, you can learn a representation for words. Uh, as a, in, in a vector space, it's called word to vec So for each word in your corpus, you have a vector, okay? There's a vector which represents each word. But these vectors, has a, they have quite interesting relationship. Uh, that was the favorite example that got uh, news coverage, you know, because it was surprising. The, the, the vector which represents word king minus the vector which represents word man plus the vector which represents woman is equal, almost equal to the vector which represents queen. So a king who is not a man but is a woman is a queen, you know. And there are many examples of this form. The distance between Ottawa and Canada is the same as the distance between Paris and France, for example. Uh, so it turned out that it works not only for words, it works for uh, images as well, and for even images and words together. You know, you can learn a space using this neural network, such that each, I mean, there's vector which represents each image, and there's vector that represents a word. And then you can multiply, or sub, so you can subtract or add these vectors together. So, for example, the vector which represents this image minus the vector which represents day plus the vector which represents night will be equal to a vector which represents this image. One of the, I mean, close to this, you know. So, if you have this scene, but it's not day, it's night, it looks like something like this. Or if you have an object, an airplane, which doesn't fly, but sailing, look like this. Or if you have a cat, which is not in a box, but, but it's on a bowl, it looks like this, you know. The image looks like this. Uh, the, you know, met, I mean, uh, now algorithms that find the ca or, or basically create a capture for images automatically, you know. You give this image to the algorithm, to the network, and the output is a woman is trying a frisbee in a park. This caption is created by the network, you know. There's a, a <coughs> basically a R and N. This is what, what we have here is fit forward ne neural network. There is a structure which is called convolutional neural network, which has been quite successful for images and language. And there is a, a structure which is called RNN, recurrent neural network. So it's a combination of convolution and recurrent neural network which can generate this type of things. So uh, 
in more related to classification, like face detection, you know, these two uh, celebrities look alike, but they are different people, and this algorithm basically can make distinction between these two, you know, realize that they're not the same person. Uh, okay, see you on Thursday. Thank you.